Welcome to Fayetteville Community Church. We welcome our church family and our visiting friends. Thank you for coming to worship with us. To find out more about our church, upcoming events, and other church activities, you may visit us online at www.fccnc.us. Anybody in here ready for count meeting? Or did you just come for an ordinary, run-of-the-mill? No, not me. You're looking at a guy that never has a bad day. I have some days that are not as good as others, but I will never give credit to the enemy for having a bad day. I went into the bank one day and a lady asked me, said, well, how are you doing, Reverend? I said, I'm doing great. She said, I've noticed that every time I ever ask you that, you always tell me you're doing great. Are you really doing great or do you just say that? I said, well, if I wasn't doing great, I'd never tell you. <laughs> I love God. I love His church and I love being a part of the body of Christ. Our world is in a mess. I didn't have to, I wouldn't have to be a rocket scientist to tell you that. If you were to ask a financial advisor what is our greatest need, he would probably say financial security. If you were to ask an insurance agent what is the greatest need in the world today, and he would probably tell you life insurance. <laughs> if you were to ask an educator, they would tell you more learning. If you were to ask a politician, the average politician today would say more socialism. But if you were to ask me, I would tell you that the greatest need that we have today is revival. Revival that brings about repentance, restoration, restitution, and a move of God. I'd like to ask you, if you would, to stand with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, touch me today. If you've ever allowed me to minister to a congregation under the anointing, I pray that you will allow that today. For the message that you have given to me to bring to them, would bring about revival. And I know that that is the will of the Father. I pray if there be anyone here today that's not a Christian, that you would save the lost, heal the sick, deliver the oppressed, and grant victory in the life of every believer in the wonderful and lovely name of our lovely Lord Jesus Christ, I pray, and amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to the second chapter of the book of Nehemiah, and I want to read one verse. This will be quite easy to remember because it'll be Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 2. Wherefore, the king said unto me, 
Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was sore afraid. The book of Nehemiah is about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem and reestablishing the gates of the city. The Jewish people for a long period of time had been in under Babylonian captivity. The Persians came along and they overthrew the Babylonian supremacy and they took charge of the land. And somewhere in about 535 B.C., the king of Persia addressed the Jewish people that had been in captivity now and he said, all of you that would like to go back home, you're free to go. History reveals to us that only about 50,000 of them left to go back to their homeland. I would like to think that had I been in that group, they wouldn't have had to have asked me twice to go back to the house of God or the land of Jerusalem. But only about 50,000 of them left. Now why would the rest of them not go? Simply because they had become so comfortable, even though they were in slavery, they had become comfortable in that situation. A lot of people don't like change. A lot of people resist change. But the ones that went back, when they got back, they started building the temple. They got discouraged because people were making fun of them. And so they quit building the temple. And here they are in a defenseless city. Their walls have been destroyed. Their gate, gates to the city have been burned. They virtually had no defense against the enemy. If you would put it in modern day terminology, they had open borders. Now keep in mind that Nehemiah and his family were part of those that remained in the land of captivity. And Nehemiah had grown up and obviously had become favorable in the eyes of the king to the point that he had become the king's cupbearer. One day, now keep in mind as a cupbearer, three times a day, Nehemiah would go before the king with a cup of wine. And before the king would ever taste the wine, Nehemiah would taste it to make sure that someone had not poisoned it in an effort to assassinate the king. And so for three times a day, for a long period of time, Nehemiah would come before the king and serve him a cup of wine. But something happens one day. A runner comes by that is from the homeland. And Nehemiah couldn't stand it. He runs out and he says to this guy, hey, tell me how are things back home? And I can hear the guy reply, well, Nehemiah, we could have talked all day long and you should never have asked me that question. 
Because our city, the land of our forefathers, lieth in desolation. The walls have been torn down. The gates have been burned. The people are in great affliction and are a reproach. And I read a few of things to you last week, and I, I just want to readdress a few of those that have made our country today become a reproach. Abortion. And let me get political, if I may. I don't know how in the world that any Christian could vote for anybody that supports abortion. The wise man said there are six things that God hates, yea, seven things, and one of those was the shedding of innocent blood. And I'm telling you that God is going to hold our country accountable for such. We are in great affliction and we are a reproach to our God. The lack of respect. I made mention of this last Sunday, and I don't think anybody caught it, but I am amazed at the parents that children are raising these days. The attacks against Israel, the attacks against our president. And again, I'm not trying to be political, but just to give you a note of where we are, Last day, last evening, there were 20 people killed in El Paso. Last night, there were nine killed in Daytona or in Dayton, Ohio. Every Republican that responded to that ended their condolences with, God be with you or we're praying for you. Wasn't so from the other side. And I've about determined that they have become the party of Antichrist. If the church doesn't stand up today for God and country, we are in a mess. But here we are. Our walls have been torn down. Our gates have been burned. We are a defenseless nation spiritually. But Nehemiah gets the word. Our country, our land, our, the home of our fathers and forefathers is in great affliction and is a reproach. Now the Bible said that when Nehemiah heard this that he sat down he began to weep, he began to pray, and he began to fast. He put a lot of attention to the news that he heard about his homeland. Four months, this man goes before the king with a Hypocritical approach. You see, in order to approach the king, you had to go before him with a smile on your face, a chirpiness in your voice, and a skip in your heel. And for four months, Nehemiah goes before the king until verse 2. And he was playing the part of a good hypocrite. Now you might think, well, that's, that's terrible. But it's not terrible because I played the part of being a good hypocrite. Now, follow me close now. <laughs> Anybody here remember back years ago when the ladies had these beehive hairdos? 
I hated those things. I come home one day, and my wife comes walking in with a beehive hairdo. And she walked up to me, and she is smiling, and she said, Honey, how do you like my new hairdo? I said, I love it. I hated it. I was so glad when those hairdos went out of style. But what I'm saying to you is that Nehemiah suppressed his feelings when he went before the king. And on this occasion, the king reached through his facade. And I want to tell you, it was a requirement that you came before the king with a smile on your face and a chirpiness in your voice and a skip in your heel. And I got news for you, community church. That's the way we still ought to come before the king of glory. We ought not to come into church with a mully grubs and, and a frown on our face like we've been drinking sour pickle juice. We need to come in with a shout in our voice and a praise to God and a glory to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Some folks remind me of a story I heard one time of a couple. Said they got up on a Sunday morning and the wife went into the bathroom and she stayed and she stayed and she stayed and she stayed and the husband is out in the hall walking back and forth like a tiger in a cage. And he finally yells out to her and says, Honey, if you don't hurry up, we're going to be late for church. And right then, the tide shifted. She comes out. She's aggravated because she's trying to make herself look pretty for him. She's trying to get every hair in place and She's just trying to make everything just perfect, and yet he's yelling at her. So she comes out. She grabs the two little boys and carries them out, throws them in the back seat of the car. The husband gets in the car, scratches the wheels backwards, and stretches the wheels, taking off, turns the curve, throws everybody to the side of the, of the car, gets to the church and walks into the church building. She's looking like Muhammad Ali and he's looking like Mike Tyson just waiting for somebody to ring the bell. And they wonder, why do I go home depressed? I'm telling you, when you walk into the house of the Lord, you need to come into his courts with thanksgiving and into his, the house of God with praise. We need to let the Lord know that we love him because he's good to us. The king looks at Nehemiah. There's a sad appearance. He says, I want to know why are you so sad when you're not sick. I know you're not sick. This must be sorrow of heart. That little phrase at the end of that verse that said, then I was sore afraid. The reason Nehemiah put that in there was because he knew right then that the king had every right to cut his head off. And he was afraid. And he said, but, oh, king, why should I not be afraid? The land of my fathers, the land of my forefathers lieth in desolation. My people are in affliction. They are in approach. And the king said, then what do you want me to do to help you out? And when I read that, I think to myself how many times we approach the Lord and we really don't, we really don't put any, any stock into what we need in our life. But I'm telling you this morning that God is saying to every one of us, just tell me what is it that you need and I'll be glad to come to your rescue. I'll be glad to come to your help 
I will be your help in a time of trouble. So God is looking for somebody here in community church to take the lead in rebuilding walls and reestablishing gates. And I'm going to ask you just point blank. You don't have to answer me. Are you the one? Now, in order to bring this to focus, I, I need to get you to use your imagination a little bit for me. I'm going to take you on a monkey hunt. <laughs> and if it's all right with you and if the cameras can tolerate it, I, I need to be down here with you. In Africa, one of the ways, not the only way, but one of the ways that they catch monkeys They go out in the jungle, they find a coconut, and they drill a hole in that coconut, and then they fill it full of candy. They'll take the coconut down the trail, and they'll lay it on the ground. Well, monkeys are creatures of curiosity. When the monkey sees the coconut laying on the ground, knowing that it ought to be in the top of the tree, the monkey will come down to investigate why the coconut is on the ground. And when he gets to looking at the coconut, he notices there's, there's a hole in it. And he gets the eyeballing in that coconut, and he sees something in there, and it's full of candy. And he runs his hand into the coconut. And he gets a handful of candy. And then he tries to pull his hand out. Well, needless to say, that little slithery hand that went in now is a bulky hand full of candy. And he can't take it out. And they say that when that happens, that monkey will start beating that coconut on the ground. He'll run over to trees and he'll bang that coconut against the trees. He'll turn all kind of flips and things, trying to get that coconut off of his hand. He doesn't have enough sense to know that all he's got to do is turn loose the candy. They say that he'll fight and fuss until the hunter hears no noise. Oh, man, I could, I, there's a whole crib of corn that could be shut right there. <laughs> One of the things that the enemy of your soul would like to do is to shut you down. It's to cause you to not have a shout in your voice and a praise to the Lord God Almighty. And when the devil gets successful like that, he can just walk up and pick you up and do anything he wants to with you. But that monkey will fight. He'll do everything he can to get that coconut off of his hand. All he's got to do is turn loose the candy. And I'm afraid people have come along and they've run their hand down in the coconut and they've got themselves a handful of jealousy. They've got themselves a handful of tail-bearing. They've got themselves a handful of lying. They've got themselves a handful of jealousy. Amen. And they wonder why I don't have a shout, why I don't have a voice in praise in the Lord. Well, I got news for you. Coconuts are heavy. 
If you got a coconut, it's obvious that you can't fellowship. You ever try to shake somebody's hand when they got a coconut at the end of their arm? <laughs> it's obvious that they're not tithe payers and givers to the church. Have you ever seen anybody with a coconut go into their pocketbook to get money out to give to the church? Come on, church. I'm telling I'm preaching good right now. I'm talking about what brings count meeting to our hearts, what brings victory to our lives. They can't be a worshiper. You ever seen anybody with a coke trying to get their hands in the air? When Byram says, everybody lift your hands and praise the Lord, you can't lift your hand because you've got a big coconut hanging at the end of your arm. I might buy a tape for this and myself. <laughs> Let me tell you what kind of coat. I heard the story one time of a man and a woman, husband and wife, got into a serious argument. And uh, they stopped talking to each other. And this goes on for several weeks, and they're not speaking. And finally, the guy decides, well, I, you know, I need to do something to, to break this. If I can make a good deal and make me some money, I can go and buy her something real nice. And that'll be, you know, guys just hate to say I'm sorry. <laughs> we do it with roses and chocolate candy and. So the guy figures out a deal, and he says, you know, but every time I've ever had to get up early in the morning, she's always woke me up, and I ain't talking to her. So he's trying to figure out how to handle this. So he finally comes up and thinks, I know what I'll do. I'll just write her a note. And he writes a note, and it says, I need to be woke up at 6 o'clock in the morning for a special deal. And he goes into the bedroom where she's already in bed, and he lays the note on her nightstand, and he gets in the bed and goes to sleep. He wakes up at 8 o'clock the next morning. He jumps up. I can't believe I've missed, I've missed my appointment. I've missed the deal. I left her a note to wake me up, and she didn't do it. I said, I don't know why. And then all of a sudden, he noticed there was a note on his nightstand. <laughs> and he walked over and looked at it and picked it up, and it said, it's 6 o'clock, and it's time for you to get up. <laughs> I had a man live next door to my church. He would come visit me occasionally, and I'd, I'd always ask him, you know, man, I'd really be pleased to have you to come and visit my church sometime. And he would always tell me, I will never put my foot in that church. Why? Well, I came over here to this church one time, and a Sunday school teacher told me that if, if I didn't quit my sinning, that I was going to hell. And he said that offended me, and I got up and walked out, and I said, I'll never go back in that church again. And I said, sir, let me tell you something. You ought to be thankful to God that somebody had the courage to tell you where you were going if you didn't stop your sinning business. Now, yeah, she may, she may have been able to have said it in a little different way. But I'm telling you, people will hold on to things that don't mean a hill of beans and let it affect their spiritual life, and it's nothing more than holding on to the candy and the coconut. I know people 
I knew a family on one occasion where that the mother and father would come into church and they would sit on this side of the church and their married son and their married daughter would sit on this side of the church and I got to noticing that about five minutes before I would pray the benediction prayer that the mother and father over here would get up and leave. And I couldn't understand that because they'd never stay around for fellowship. And I found out, I just got to prying a little bit, and I found out that they had had some kind of a break in their family over the sale of some timber that the father, the father had given the son and the daughter a piece of land. And they wake up one morning, they hear all these chainsaws, and they go out there and ask the guy, what's going on? Well, we're cutting the timber. Mr. So-and-so told us to come and cut the timber. They contact the dad, and the dad says, well, I gave you the land. I didn't give you the timber. I preached that man's funeral, the father, several years later, only to have the son to walk up to me after the funeral and said to me, thank God, he's dead. A coconut. If somebody is not willing to, I'm telling you that there's nothing in this world that means more to me than to feel the touch of the Master's hand. I'm not going to hold a grudge. I don't have any iniquity in my heart against anybody on the face of this earth. A dear friend of mine was getting ready to go into open heart surgery. He said to his wife, if something happens and I don't come out, I want you to tell my friends that I had a clear conscience, clean hands, and a pure heart. And I'm telling you, that's what will get you through the pearly gates. But so many people are, they want to hold on to that coconut. They want to hold on to that candy that deprives them of a relationship with God. And I ask you, is it worth it? God forbid that what happened in El Paso and Dayton happened here. But to ensure my relationship with God, I want to make sure that I don't have any coconuts when I walk out the door. Because when I leave home, when I left home, I don't have to go back home to make anything right with my wife or my family or any acquaintances that I have because turning loose the candy gives me the freedom to worship God in spirit and in truth. Would you stand with me, please? Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anybody in this building that has a coconut at the end of their arm. I will tell you this, you know, coconuts are heavy and they'll, co they'll sort of cause you to walk a little cocksided. But the wise man said that the Lord would bless those that walk upright before the Lord.
Whether you have a coconut or not, I'm going to show you how to get rid of the coconut. But I need everybody in this building, whether you're visiting or not, I need you to come and stand with me down here at this front. People would ab absolutely be amazed if they knew what they would gain by just turning loose the candy. We were flying back from Florida recently and I noticed when we got to the airport it just hit me as I saw people rushing to the carousel and I stood there and I watched them and I thought to myself they checked that baggage and now they're making a beeline to take that baggage back I'm telling you, when I turn it loose, I walk out of this building with clean hands, a clear conscience, and a pure heart. Because I want to see Jesus one day. Now, nobody in here knows whether you got a coconut hanging at the end of your arm. Nobody knows but you. But I, I'm going to tell you how we're going to get rid of them this morning. I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I want you with the exuberance and the enthusiasm of a cheerleader. And I want you to do it like this. I'm free! One. Two. Three. I'm free! <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! One. Two. Son hath set free is free indeed. One, two, three, I'm free. You can walk out of here today. I preached this service a couple of years ago. A Sunday morning and when I came back to service on Sunday night Brother Wesley from that side of the altar all the way across the front was coconuts that church had gone into every food line Harris Teeter where they brought coconuts and I, I'm telling you I saw people walking down to the altar and laying coconuts on the altar and breaking down and crying like babies. One of the greatest moves of God that I've ever witnessed in my life. And I thought it's so simple. We got to give it up. There comes a time in your life of some things that you just have to let go. Just got to let them go. I counsel with people on a weekly basis. And I would say nine out of ten times I have to say to couples, you know what? You 
be amazed at what it will do for your family. Because I've had, I've had husbands say, oh, if you hadn't have done that five years ago, we wouldn't be in this financial mess that we're in now. And she say, well, if you hadn't have bought all that fishing gear, we wouldn't be in this mess now. I say, come on, folks. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. And I'm telling you, you'll have the best night's sleep you've had. My pillow couldn't even come close to giving you the kind of sleep and rest that you'll have when you say that my coconut is gone. My coconut is gone. Let today be the beginning of a new day in your life. I was a good person when I came in. I'm going to be a better person when I walk out. Could I, I don't want anything. There could be some crazy nut out there next week that I may walk into a Walmart and get shot. And I don't want nobody saying, well, you know, he had a grudge against somebody or he held something against so-and-so. No. You know where my coconuts are? They're under the blood. Because I'm free. Heavenly Father, I bring this wonderful group of people before you today, pleading the blood of Jesus Christ over every man, woman, young person in this house, helping us to make a decision. That I'm going to be the one that's going to take the lead in rebuilding walls and reestablishing the gates in this great church. Because we are reminded of the word that you gave to us the first day that I was on this campus when you spoke to my heart and said, Tell the people. That community church is getting ready for a breakthrough that will involve signs and wonders for Satan hath desired to sift them like wheat but you Lord said I have prayed for them that their faith fail them not now help us to make sure that all coconuts are under the blood. I ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our lovely Lord, and for his glory. And amen. Amen. I'm free from the fear of tomorrow I am free from the guilt of the past for I've traded my shackles for a glorious song I'm free Love somebody, tell them L-G-L-E-O. God bless you.